Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm not sure if this is your first panel, but some of us have been running all day, and so we'll just get right to it. Um, I, just a brief reminder, because this is a session uh, about plastic pollution, while with our title literally called Taking Out the Trash, um, please be mindful of what you leave behind. Um, in this room. So that said, I'm going to go ahead and start to introduce myself. My name is Rachel Ramirez. I am the CNN writer and reporter with our climate team there. Um, and today we're going to be talking about plastics and why 2024 is a crucial year for this type of discussion. Um, now, I, I'm sure a lot of you know, and I might be pe preaching to the choir here, but plastics is a very complex and nuanced topic, and we obviously can't get through all every aspect of the plastic issue in one hour, um, but, but I think it's worth underscoring where plastics come from and how they are a key part of the climate problem. So I'm just going to kind of lay the groundwork here before I toss it to our fellow panelists, but um, you know, n not a lot of people kind of make this connection with climate change, but I'm just going to explain it anyway and break it down for you all. Um, so the life cycle of plastic really begins underground, um, where oil and gas are extracted from deep below the surface of the planet, and these are obviously fossil fuels, which are contributing largely to the climate crisis. Um, so these fossil fuels, fuels are then refined in facilities using extreme temperatures and significant amount of water and energy where they're transformed into pellets that are eventually melted and molded into things like water bottles, packaging, clothes, garbage bags, things that you probably have with you right now. Um, you know, and at the end of it, once it's thrown out there, they don't break down. And this leads to widespread consequences globally. Um, now I'd love to turn it over to this wonderful group of panelists. Um, please, I'm going to have you all briefly introduce yourself and give me one fun fact, maybe not fun, um, about plastics. It could be a statistic, a historical context, something that will really ground our conversation here today. I'll start with Marissa. Great. Hi, I'm Marissa McGowan. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at L'Oreal Group in North America. And my fun fact is, I'm going to have you guess how many recycling systems we have since we're here in the United States. Um, how many recycling systems do you think we have in the United States? I'm going to give you a choice, 90, 900, or 9,000. Okay, I heard a 9,000. So we have over 9,000 recycling systems here in the United States. And even with that fragmented system, I'm going to give you one more ch chance to participate. Um, how many households do not have access to curbside recycling or convenient recycling today? And I'll give you a choice again. 20,000, 200,000, or 20 million? 20 million. 20 million. All right. So that just lays a little bit of the groundwork. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Manuela Zonensign. I'm the CEO and founder of Kadea. We're a Chicago-based company that has a path to eliminate the need for single-use beverage containers forever, for everyone, everywhere. Uh, we do that. We've designed a bottling plant that is the size of a vending machine. Like a vending machine, you go up to our station and you choose what beverage you want. It could be filtered water, sparkling water, Coke, Pepsi, cold brew, you name it. Unlike a vending machine, you return our design patented bottle, which is stainless steel, infinitely reusable, to any station in the network. Think of it as bike sharing for bottles. You just borrow the bottle to enjoy the product inside. And upon returning it, our patented station washes, sanitizes, inspects, and refills the bottle inside of itself, which eliminates a third of the cost, 75% of the carbon footprint, 99.9% .9 of the plastic compared to single use. And uh, I'll give a little bit of historical context. So, you know, everyone says, and especially people who are green geeks like we are and we carry reusable bottles everywhere, we say, oh, well, if everyone could just carry a reusable bottle, then we'd be fine. So in 2021, the market in the United States for single-use plastic water bottles was 40 billion. The market for reusable bottles was 2 billion. And you may say, yeah, reusable is a smaller market. They get reused. Absolutely, except the delta is getting worse. By 2030, single-use plastic water bottles will be $67 billion market, 
and reusables will be a $2.6 billion market, going from a 20x market size to a 25x market size. And then you may say, well, Gen Z, that's our great green hope, right? Well, it turns out Gen Zers are the number one consumers of reusable water bottles and the number one consumer of single-use plastic water bottles. Everybody is hydrating all the time, and even if you have a reusable container, you don't have access to great quality water 100% of the time. So I'll hand it over to the next speaker. Okay, thank you very much. So I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it now because Marissa did it. So I'm going to ask about, uh, so, okay, which is the right number? Uh, this is millions of metric tons of plastic waste going into the ocean every year. What is the right number? Is it 8 million, 12 million, 14 million, 23 million, or 3 million? What do you think? Okay. All right, and the answer is it just actually, it, it kind of, in, some, in a lot of ways, it doesn't matter. We don't actually know, we don't actually know the exact amount. But what has happened, and we, we can thank people who, um, maybe we all know, but these are people like Jenna, Jenna Jambeck and Margaret Spring, Carl Lavender Laws, did the original studies for plastic pollution entering into the ocean that woke us all up to this issue, along with the images that you've all seen of the turtle with the straw in its nose, or a marine mammal stuck in a fishing net. Um, and that, they, that power and imagery has led to a United Nations process that's taken kind of 10 years, I would say, of work to get to uh, Resolution 514, which happened two years ago at UNEA 5.2. Uh, myself and my colleague, Kerry Holland, who's here from the State Department, um, we just came back from uh, UNEA 6, where we negotiated an another whole, whole host of environment resolutions. None of them, to be honest, none of them were as big as the plastics deal. It is huge. We um, are really excited about this treaty. We're partway through the treaty negotiations process. Um, it has is, it is driven action across the whole of U.S. government, which we are about to announce domestically, more action around Earth Day. You'll hear from uh, my colleagues at CEQ, the Council of Envir Envir Environmental Quality, Jonathan Black, EPA's re re uh, publishing a national strategy. Um, all of these studies where the data wasn't really, it was really hard to kind of pin the numbers down, uh, but it didn't matter. It, it scaled the problem and it has led to action. And I couldn't be more personally excited to be part of this. And I just realized I forgot to tell you that I'm Jonathan Gillibrand. <laughs> I work at the State Department. I am a Biden administration appointee in the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science and, Te and Technology, and we also cover space. Um, let me pass it along. Okay. Well, thank you. And my name is Mireille Endara de Eras. I am from Panama, and I chair a grassroots organization called Marea Verde. One of the things that we do is try to stop waste from reaching the oceans. And my fun fact on plastic, this is our river plastic intervention in the Juan Diaz River in Panama. The orange floating barrier is plastic, but not all plastic is bad. Um, its name is Bob. Bob stands for barrera or basura, which is barrier or trash in Spanish. And Bob retains all the floating debris coming down from the river. When it rains, a lot of, the, a lot of garbage flows down that river out onto the oceans. And um, Bob helps to stop that barrier and directs it to Wanda. Wanda's that machine that has the wheel. And Wanda stands for wheel and action. Wheel because of that water wheel, which helps to harness the energy from the water flow. And it, she also has a solar panel system as a backup energy system. Both energies um, help move a main conveyor belt that um, an array system that uh, mount all the garbage onto a Wanda. Once the trash is on Wanda, it gets manually separated into recyclables, which in Panama for plastics are only one and two, PET and HDPE. The rest is placed in a container, as you see it in the back of Wanda, there is a little garbage barge coming out. That's where all the rest of the trash gets uh, placed and a uh, exchange sent to landfill for lack of a better option currently. Uh, and that secondary conveyor, the one that you see coming up into that other building, is that a uh, sorting center where all the recyclables are contained until we have enough volume to send to be recycled. This last photo is just a photo of how Wanda can, and Bob, their happy marriage, can retain <laughs> all this waste from going into the oceans.
Thank you. We love Bob and Wanda. <laughs> <laughs> um, and not to um, steal Manuela's thunder, but her water bottle, I just learned for you, all, all of you on-to-go people, you can carry the bottle with your phone oh, yeah. pretty easily the because of the, the flat oh, surface on the side. And you can also kind of, okay. Anyway, she'll, she'll talk more about it. Um, but I guess I, I, I want to kind of start also with what's been in recent news articles, um, specifically this report um, from the nonprofit research group uh, Center for Climate Integrity on how you know, the plastics industry has worked for decades to convince um, people that recycling would keep plastic waste and, waste and pollution out of the environment, and yet they knew that recycling wasn't the solution. In fact, and a lot of you know that only 9% of our plastic waste does get recycled. Um, so um, whoever wanted, wants to hop in, thoughts on this, and just in terms of solutions, uh, what role do you believe innovation and policy um, play in abating plastic pollution? So anyone can take a stab at that. All right, I'm going to jump in. <laughs> so um, innovation and policy, I think, are key. We think are key at L'Oreal Group to solving for the plastics challenge. Everything we do, we think about under three pillars on the sustainability side. At risk of sounding like talking points, there's an internal piece, transforming ourselves. So that makes everything we make, and for those who don't know, we're the largest beauty company, so most of you have either our shampoo, our makeup, a lotion, a potion in your home that we make. So make everything either with less, no, or better plastics, right? So a lot of work internally to drive for better packaging solutions. Then how are we empowering our business ecosystem? How are we working with policy? So in 20, well, 20 years ago, we were one of the first companies to support EPR in France or extended producer responsibility. For those who don't know, that's companies continuing, manufacturers continuing to take responsibility for the end of life of their um, uh, plastics. In the United States, we've been very active in the EPR discussion and a co-founder of a national pro or producer responsibility organization, which has uh, just been adopted by California and Colorado. Why do we care so much about this? We believe we need to make the best products designed for recyclability, and we need to enhance the recycling system so they can receive them and put more back into the communities. Our third pillar of work is around um, solving problems that are larger than ourselves, which I guess is what we do every day. Um, but an example of that is our Circular Innovation Fund. We have one example that may be of interest to all of you. With our Biotherm brand, we're working with an, a startup that is trying to make plastic stronger um, so that the pellets can actually, it can be reground into pellets more times. Right now, the average is two to three times. So how do we make sure that we're even creating or designing for plastics that can be recycled over and over and used in a continuous loop? So I hope that gives you a little sense of how we're thinking about innovation and policy um, through the way that we bring our, our sustainability to life. So I'm at the other extreme here at Kadea. We're early stage startup. We're uh, headquartered in Chicago. We have three units in the field. We've sold out of stations for 2024. Um, we have 35 units booked and we can only produce 20 for this year. So we're starting to sell for 2025. Our go to market, I'll add just because it adds a little bit of context to um, our strategy and how we think about innovation ultimately um, is we're focused on industrial workplaces. So not people like you and me. Um, construction workers, uh, people who work at fulfillment centers, people at manufacturing plants, and then soldiers. Uh, we have contracts with the U.S. Air Force. So these are populations that need to hydrate, not only to do their job, but existentially. And therefore, their employers are concerned and already pay for hydration solutions. So uh, when we, Kadea, placed our alpha prototype in October 2022 at a construction site in downtown Indianapolis, the project executive said, well, I want to buy that unit even before I plugged it in, which is you know, music to an entrepreneur's ears. And I said, well, why, why do you want to buy this? He said, what am I going to do when Kadea leaves? Go back to buying and distributing single-use plastic water bottles. What I realized there is in these environments, the problem is not the plastic. The problem is the logistics of transporting pallets of bottles of water through that entire supply chain that Rachel just told us about, and then from loading dock to loading dock, truck to truck, hand by hand, every single beverage that you're gonna consume, a human hand had to put that container out there for you. 
So it's, it's incredibly logistically intensive and therefore also expensive. So coming back to this question of innovation, you know, I started with a really simple premise. I was living in New York City and I said, well, we can do city bike. Could we do that for bottles? And I literally started saying to people, can we do bike sharing for bottles? People say, oh, that's insane. How are you ever going to do that? And I was like, well, we have dishwashers. I mean, like, <laughs> this is like known technology. We're not putting a man on the moon. Um, you know, and so the first question was, well, how are you going to get the bottles back? And what we found is by adding a QR code on the bottom of the bottle, and then in these workplaces, we asked people to use their work badges to scan out a bottle, we're getting 99% of our bottles back with no penalty or deposit. Um, so that was the first solve. And then, well, how are you going to sanitize the bottles? And now we have the world's best bottle wash system, according to Ecolab, because we've optimized our wash to only wash for our bottle over and over again, rather than your dishwasher where you're putting plates and cups of all different shapes and different kind of, you know, gumming, gummy, gross debris that's still on there. So I'd say innovation for us is really coming to the problem um, with kind of a beginner's mindset and going back to first principles and asking, wait a second, what was the problem that we actually need to solve? And rather than saying, well, plastics is the problem. Actually, that isn't the problem. It turns out it's logistics, it's costly, there's labor. Um, it, if you really think about the fact that consumers are going to continue to drink water, as long as we're around, we're gonna be drinking water and probably they wanna drink Coke and coffee and other things too. How do we then deliver that product with a solution where we just say, but the container has to be reusable? So I think the other piece of innovation is just setting design constraints and that's why I think sustainability and climate tech is so fascinating because actually it's just design constraints and you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Constraints create better products. So that's how I think about innovation. In terms of policy, we are exploding the world because we don't fit into any neat buckets. Like the way reuse is defined today does not fit. Reuse means that you own your container. It's actually refill. And there's a lot of language coming out from upstream solutions, by the way, around the language between reuse and refill that is really worth getting into. I won't bore you with that. But my point is to say that reuse right now is you bring your own container and then you bring it home. You own the container. In my case, you don't own the container. You're borrowing the container. So we don't fit into reuse, actually, which is insane. Um, or similarly, we, we've designed a bottling plant, right? It does everything that a bottling plant does, but at the point of use. But if I get regulated as a bottling plant, every single place where I put my station, it has to be zoned as a manufacturing site. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where we're contending with policy in terms of innovating today. Speaking of policy. I, yeah, I can take that <laughs> right from there. That's fantastic, Manuel, really. So um, we are d w working on the treaty, and what we're trying to do with the treaty is make space for companies like yours and that kind of innovation. And uh, we're, we're just fully committed to that. We work with PR3 and Upstream and others to, yeah. to make sure this is going to be happening. Um, I want to give a shout out to Monica Medina. I don't know if she knows I was going to do this, but she's in the audience here. She's, <laughs> she was my boss when I first arrived at OES. And what we did at one of the first plastic treaty negotiations was have an event around reuse. It was one of the most successful events that, that happened at the negotiations. And it got everybody away from this idea that recycling was the solution. And just, just killed that right off the bat. So now the treaty um, is, is, it's about stopping plastic pollution, but really what it's going to have to do is build a circular economy for plastics. So we're going to go all the way up that chain to material selection, new materials, material design, pro product design. Uh, reuse is going to have to be, and re refill, however it's defined, will have to be a large part of the solution. Um, and just to say quickly, I know that uh, the recycling rate's been pretty poor, but the, the, the government's working on it. We're going to be putting a lot of money in through the bipartisan infrastructure funds. EPA is doing a lot of work uh, putting, in, putting in recycling and reuse infrastructure and educating people around that. And a lot of our states are introducing EPR, which is fantastic. Maybe we're getting up to about a third of the population. And those things are really going to help bring the recycle rates back up. I'll pass it over. Would you like? Thanks. Well, Jonathan, I really do hope that you are and everybody else participating in these negotiations successful at curbing plastic production because if we don't really cut production, 
we're never going to really do <laughs> very much, either with recycling, reusing, or whichever re no, name you want to <laughs> name it. Um, as long as we keep selling more plastic, we will never be able to get rid of plastic pollution. So I really, really hope that this opportunity where the world is looking at the plastic treaty as the singular moment where we can make change um, in this pollution that has taken less than 100 years to drown us, uh, you can make that pivot and help us shift into really sustainability. But the, well, that being said, um, what does um, policy for us? I think we share a lot of the same frustrations that Manuela was commenting before in Panama. Um, just with Wanda and Bob, we were working in a space where <laughs> there were no clear regulations on how can we do interventions in rivers. So having to speak to the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Public Works, the municipalities, the different um, governments that share responsibility over a single geographical or a sectorial space, but that had never collaborated or thought about um, these sort of out-of-the-box solutions or, or um, act actions that can help with this uh, problem. And then on, and that's for policy, one of the, of the um, perhaps uh, lessons learned that we, um, policy is always a little slower and sometimes it takes a lot of pushing and perseverance from nonprofits or, or entrepreneurs or uh, outside parties to sort of help lead that way and, and I'm glad that um, the Plastic Street is looking at, at that as, as an option for, for moving forward on, on how to make new policy. And then on um, innovation, well, one is an innovation. We look at innovation as a needed a way to deal with all this legacy that we are going to have with these plastics, not only in the environmental uh, restoration sort of space, but also in industry. What does this mean for health? What does this mean for food and beverage? What does that mean for uh, are the community lifestyle in general? Uh, and that's how we are trying to approach innovation in the strategies that we uh, set out to do, not only with uh, in the river as we work, but also in the community work that we do in education, which is also key. No, thank you for that. And and just I guess building off of what um, specifically Marissa and Manuela's um, work. Um, I, I'm curious, what does innovation in this space look like to you in, in, in your organization? Just diving into that a little bit more. And is it geared towards you know, a particular part of the life cycle, upstream, downstream? Um, and I guess, Manuel, I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking about you know, when your, your analogy of just like the city bikes and vending machines. We're not, like, how are you scale, working to scale up um, the, this whole process for you? Um, yeah, so I guess the third big, um, innovation in what we're doing at Kadea after capturing those return rates, excuse me, and then um, building the best bottle wash system in the world is uh, I moved back to Chicago from New York City where I'd been for, I'd been in New York for a while, but anyways, I started Kadea. I'd been there for about a year at that point. My husband and I and young son decided to move back to Chicago and um, still in the middle of COVID, but I took a, I know this is ironic, but I took a sailing lesson and then I was in a boat with a woman who works in construction. And I was telling her about Kadea and she said, well, you know, I, could, I can't get you into our office, but I could get you on a construction site tomorrow. That was the first time I'd heard that uh, about a year, year and a half into the business. And so when, that, I know that doesn't sound like so startling in retrospect, but no one else had been delivering reusable solutions for industrial workers. And it turns out that those are the people who most need our solution. Also, those are the people who are gonna go to work every single day while white collar workers get to you know, do remote or hybrid work. Um, so I think when, I, when you talk about innovation, it's really about as you, as you evolve the idea, first of all, telling everybody you meet about your idea because you never know where the insight is gonna come from. Right. And so like taking the hits all the time of like, no, that's weird, that's crazy, what are you doing? Until you hear that person be like, well, this, why don't you do it over here? 
Um, that's one thing about innovation. It's, I think people imagine that you like wake up one morning and the light bulb goes off and you're like, ah, I discovered the future. And it's, it's not like that. It's just iterative. It's like constantly making mistakes um, and, and improving. Um, and then, so I would argue that it's innovation for us is not just technological innovation. It's business model innovation, it's distribution innovation, it's materials innovation. Eventually, I wanna build a fully circular stainless steel economy for the United States. Like, that's gonna be an extension of the business. Yeah, and, and we can do that. Um, so, I guess it's, it's thinking really big and following where the opportunities go. Um, and there was one part of your question, oh, about how are we gonna scale? So, we're kind of facing like an Uber problem or a Tesla problem, right, which is like, Okay, if you're Uber, how do you deliver value to your very first customer of an entire network of cars when you're a startup, right? And what Uber did is they chose a cross street in Soma, which is the end of Caltrain, where they knew commuters were coming up from Silicon Valley every day at a certain time. And they made sure there were black cars sitting around. And they literally had a phone number you would text. And as soon as someone texted, they'd be like, okay, get the car over there. Get the car over there. That's how we're starting. Right, and so it's like, it's like an onion where we've focused on closed environments where people are going every single day, where there's discipline, right? These are people who borrow equipment um, and they need to hydrate so they're drinking multiple times. Um, and we've plugged in our solution to be about worker safety because we have um, attribution to the individual consumer. And what's happening, so we've totally sold out, as I mentioned, in construction, manufacturing, fulfillment, we'll continue to do that. Honestly, we could do that for five years and we'll be in a $1.5 billion business. So that's a, a viable business there in and of itself. But my goal is to eliminate all single-use beverage packaging forever. So the way we're gonna do that is we're starting to find that there are other environments that are really interesting with a similar end user. Sports arenas, for example, is really interesting. Closed environment, really high margins. You pay seven bucks for a bottle of water at a sports stadium. I, I can make money when the bottle's 27 cents. So that's how much margin I can be making. Um, and then from there, we're interested in uh, what we call like leisure, uh, leisure, so movie theaters, amusement parks, and then eventually hospitality, which would be hotels, eventually airports. So the idea is we do partnerships, with United and American, and you would get your Cadea bottle when you board the flight you choose what beverage you want. Now they don't have to do trolley service. The weight is the exact same. We've eliminated all the plastic. And then when you land, you know, from Miami to O'Hare, you just drop your bottle off. And we'll wash it, sanitize it, inspect it, and refill it for the next person. So that's part of how we're thinking about it. Well, I'll, tell you, I'll take it in a little different direction. So I think um, I mentioned before that from an innovation perspective, we're trying to improve the sustainability and performance of every product we make. So we have two internal sort of incentives. We have many, but two that I would call out right now. The first is in order to every reformulation we do, so when a new product goes on market or it's a reformulation of a bestseller, something that we've sold over and over again, we do a life cycle analysis behind it. It's called the spot score. And if your spot score is not better, your spot score is a full life cycle assessment. So you're looking at formula, you're looking at packaging, you're looking at the overall performance of the product. If that product spot score has not improved, meaning it has gotten more sustainable, uh, we then have to get go through a very, very lengthy waiver process. And it's very embarrassing to have to get a waiver. So uh, people really do work very hard to make sure, thinking 18, 24 months out, that if they're going to be doing a big renovation, especially on a bestseller, they do not want to end up in a situation where they would have to apply for a waiver. So they're thinking about all the things they have to build into that reformulation, both formula and packaging, from the outset. We also do, uh, we do tie our bonus to uh, sustainability targets, which include for our packaging teams, um, progress against, reuse, reduce, and then recyclability of the, con of the content that we're using. That applies to everybody. That's not just management. That's not just you know the most senior people. That's everybody who's bonus eligible in our company has three different metrics that they're graded on that rolls into the business performance of um, that that's calculated. So those are how we think about it, at least the incentive process. I think a good example of how we're trying to innovate. It may sound obvious, but refills. Um, I I 
this is fun that you just mentioned talk to everybody because we're looking at refill as a service with one of our brands where basically all you own is the formula, right? You're renting the packaging and there are all these challenges. So I'm very excited to hear that you're working through those and then maybe we could talk after. But refill, just think of a, a pouch, right? A small pouch that you're going to bring into a retailer. You wanna go sell into a retailer some new product. That means taking shelf space away from your original product. It means bringing a new gesture to your customer. So what kind of consumer education is needed? Does the refill sit with the parent bottle? Is that an area of just refillables or do you want to put it with the shampoos and have it there? There's a lot that goes into changing behavior. So not only does a consumer have to buy the refill, take it home, refill their bottle enough times to make that worthwhile, um, but they also have to, you have to work with your you know, big box retailer to make sure that that's easy and convenient and simple and that the consumer actually sees a benefit of that. So we're pushing very hard on refillable formats in the form of pouches right now. So hopefully you'll see them and you'll take a think about how, you know, that, that's just changing your own mindset in, in uh, exercising refill. No, speaking of changing mindsets, I want to bring in Mary and um, Jonathan here. If we could talk about community engagement just a little bit, you know, earlier in the session, people were talking about changing mindset, not this session, but previous mm -hmm. session. Um, people were talking about how we change people's mindset to kind of, you know, spark change. And a core part of slashing plastic pollution at a wider scale is exactly that, changing people's mindset and, and convincing them why the, you know, why this must be done. Um, which I'm sure a lot of you all know can be very difficult. Um, so w what are some innovative and creative ways you all are doing um, uh, doing this in your role in terms of engaging communities and just talking to them? Well, I think that um, most people don't believe that um, or, or are probably not aware of how plastics are or what is your plastic footprint? I mean, we don't go around thinking this is my plastic footprint or this is my carbon footprint. Most people, I guess the people in this room are a little different, that's why we're here. But in general, the eight billion people out there don't necessarily think in those terms. <laughs> and I, it's, I think we need to make it personal to some level, right? We need to also understand what are the levers that, what are the needs and the values that move people. Um, so one of the things that we do in the communities where we work is in, in understanding, for example, in one of the com in many of the communities where we work, unemployment is a big issue. So, what can we do to connect plastics and unemployment? Where we set out to build a module that's a four-in-one plastics transformation module that is geared to um, train entrepreneurs in communities to teach them what plastics can become and how you can then stimulate your creativity and your capacities in thinking beyond your regular day-to-day -day maybe a circle of a opportunities in being an, an entrepreneur. So those are sort of the ideas that we try to do when thinking about how to engage and promote behavior change in communities. Oh, great. So I want to talk about a couple of, couple of different things because State Department, we work really hard on community engagement. Um, we put a lot of time into uh, listening to people so that we get the treaty right, essentially. And that can, that's communities, it's also business. business. Um, we talk to our NGOs um, and we, we spend a lot of time doing it and it's really valuable. Um, we know, for example, that systems like reuse don't work when you don't engage the community. Uh, and when communities are engaged, you get much better outcomes. Um, what we've also realized is that we can't do it alone. So we're the governments, right? The treaty tells governments what to do. It's governments, federal governments that sign the, that sign the treaty. So what we've also done is we've, we've, we've really made a lot of space within the treaty for other groups to get involved. So that would be um, uh, so that we can engage the private sector and so that we can engage, engage NGOs and so we can engage what we call subnational governments. I'm not sure if... That's, that's a State Department phrase, and we have an ambassador, Ambassador Hachigian, who runs this group, and we do outreach to cities, uh, states. Um, and we find that our mayors often have the best ideas about how to do things, and we're very actively involved in doing that. Um, the other thing that's really, really important is we've set up um, a public-private partnership to sit alongside 
our efforts in the treaty. And the reason for that is we need to engage um, everybody. And we've called, this is called EPIC, it's the uh, End Plastic Pollution International Collaborative. Um, I just want to mention Aspen, our, our uh, awesome hosts here, are also a uh, host partner within EPIC. So we have the International Union for Conservation of Nature, Aspen, the Ocean Foundation, and Serious Business, who are running EPIC. State Department has put $15 million into this. We're going to go out. We're going to. It's, it's set up in a structure that it can take further funding in from other groups, um, and this is essentially a space for innov innovation and for spreading awareness. Um, it's going to convene meetings and it's going to share best practice and innovation, and it's also going to do projects in the field. And uh, we're going to start in Africa and the Caribbean, and those projects will be um, uh, pilot projects initially, like working with countries on how to understand how plastics flow through their economy. Big, big picture stuff and how we can help them um, address pollution. They just don't have the capacity. Um, it's one real other really exciting thing is we think that we can possibly leapfrog some of these countries over. Um, right? So we'd rather get them doing what you've got here and uh, act, act, act before they end up with the same kind of in, uh, issues that you've got cleaning, out, cleaning it up out of your rivers. So I'd rather have the money go into those kinds of projects than, than uh, just in the cleanup end. So very much upstream. Yeah. And no, thank you for that. And I, I want everyone to start thinking about questions they have um, before we get into audience Q&A. Um, I'll do my best to kind of try to answer and get to all of you. But um, just one more question. How does your vision of innovation lead to achieving long-term um, plastic goals, including what Jonathan has been alluding to this whole time, which is the intended goals of the UN Plastics Treaty. And I guess, you know, just thinking about 2024 as we head into um, more negotiations about plastics, um, you know, why is this such a crucial year? Anyone can take a stab at that. Jonathan, I mean, you can continue. I could go straight <laughs> into that if you like, yeah. So it's really important that we get a treaty. It's really important that we get a global treaty. We have to get everybody on board, including the polluting countries and the producing co countries, you know, obviously. Um, we, we feel like we are going to do that. If I, there's one thing I can leave you guys with as we leave here today, it's a message of positivity. Um, we are going to get it done. Um, we, we are very optimistic about getting a treaty together by the end of the year. It's really important because what it does is it raises awareness in people's minds and it, is, it inspires the globe. So you can see action already. People are moving already, right? There's a lot of interest in businesses like yours. Um, com big companies are already taking a lot of action, getting out of ahead of this happening. Um, I'm a huge fan of, uh, the, of the, the Paris Climate Accords. I know that we all know that we're not necessarily getting where we might be, but just look at the awareness around the world of people who are just doing that little bit for climate. We want that for plastics. We want everybody to be thinking, can I do a little bit better with plastics? And I don't just mean the consumer, I'm not putting it on them, but it's product designers, material designers, it's the, it's the companies that make the polymers, it's all of us. So um, couldn't be more excited about this. <laughs> and um, okay. as L'Oreal Group, we were one of the early uh, siders of the business coalition to support the UN Plastics Treaty. We want to see the Plastics Treaty and plastic pollution full stop. We also think there's a lot of additional benefits, including more access to upcycled and recycled content, better plastics, as well as this, the reduction in greenhouse gases. So we're very excited about this as well. There's a lot of other work to do, as you mentioned, but this is, this is something that we came out very early on and supported and continue to support and show up to support. We wanna send those messages to our governments too. Okay. Maybe I can throw out one stat. Um, real quick, Absolutely. Uh, which is so um, I think this was World Economic Forum and BCG maybe two years ago came out with research showing that 50% of global emissions were attributable to uh, 10 supply chains, just the supply chains, um, and one of them was fast moving consumer goods responsible for 5%. So I think circling back, Rachel, to where you started. You know, we think of plastics just as like a, a fi you know, it's like a visible pain point, right, that annoys us and we know that it like it's, we're consuming it and we know that animals are consuming it. But it is, it really is a climate question because it, it contributes such a huge amount to global emissions. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm not sure if anyone would be on Plastics is here. It's a nonprofit founded by a former EPA regional administrator, Judith. And, um, but she always talks about how plastics is going to be sort of the next coal, right? And um, if we don't think about plastics as a climate problem, then then uh, this whole problem might be inevitable and it's going to be, you know, this next coal industry where we might have to really, really work and face it out, but it's going to take years. Um, yeah, I, let's, I'm going to go ahead and field questions. We have one right here. I'm not sure if we have a mic floating around. Um, okay. And I'll repeat the, I'll try to repeat the question too. The great garbage patch, right? I understand that there are also um, microbiological uh, techniques where there are certain bacteria that are going to eat up plastic. I don't know what where that stands, uh, and how do you police this? I'm going to take that one. <laughs> okay, so I don't know the answer, but um, I, I, I know what we're going to do to try to solve real, really big issues like that. So as part of EPIC, our public-private partnership, we're actually going to work with Aspen, and uh, we're going to launch an innovation prize, a competition, which is going to try to solve the really big, big problems like this. Uh, it could be that. It could be other things. We're going we're gonna to go out and come out and, and try to find out what are the biggest um, prizes that we could set that would make the biggest difference. Um, and tackle the hardest problems so to unlock innovation. Don't know if it'll be that one, but uh, there's Ocean Cleanup, which are working on that. I don't know if there's someone from Ocean Cleanup here, but uh, they are they are the leading company that's trying to clean up that garbage patch right now. Well, and yeah. I would just jump in to say similar to what Manuela said. I think there we need every idea, right? Because what I can tell you, I don't know what that is, but I'm. it's not going to be the only thing or the one thing. And that's what's, I think, exciting, but also hard about this work is you just iterate and iterate and iterate. And it's going to take, you know, someone working on how to break down that trash island. It's going to take people thinking differently about how they consume so we don't get the feed that begins. It's going to take all of us innovating on the types of materials we use and how we bring that to market. Um, you know, it's it's just all of it. It's so much yeah. um, in a good, you know, it's exciting, but it's also daunting. Yes, I agree. And I just wanted to complement that point um, by saying that you never know where the next best idea is going to come from. Like that sailboat trip that you took that day, Manuela, yeah, you just don't know. And I think a lot of the th things that we've tried in Panama are ideas that have already been proven out there, but we're just bringing to the context and the culture and the situation that we have in Panama. And maybe not even necessarily for garbage um, or pollution or plastic pollution per se, but rather used in other purposes that we are then um, applying into this context. So it's going to take a lot of that interconnection of, you know, um, ways that we've thought of other problems that we can then connect and bring into this context for the garbage patch, for uh, ways to improve supply chains or for cleanups. Right, and, and not to be, I know we're focused on solutions here, but you talked about microbiology and I'm, <laughs> I'm just thinking about just how widespread this plastics problem, right, is we've been seeing a lot of more microplastics, nanoplastic research studies um, getting found in our, in our, inside our bodies because of the consequences, again, of the plastic industry. And just like climate, it, we need this portfolio of action that a lot of, a lot of which already exists. Um, no, thank you. Well, next question. I think I see a hand over there. Very end. I'll let you decide, Alison. <laughs> Is this on? Okay. Uh, Bill Carney, I'm a reporter with the Sun Sentinel. Um, as you all know, plastic is incredibly, incredibly ubiquitous. My tape recorder's case is made of plastic. The fabric on our seats is made of plastic. Any, where do we stand in terms of replacing plastic with something biodegradable? I mean, it's a massive question, but it seems, you know, replacing bottles is one thing, and that's incredibly commendable, and I hope that takes off. But there's so many other uses 
in fact, like, you know, ski clothing, scuba suits, how do we replace those things? Question. Um, I don't have an answer as well um, for that specific question, but uh, I think your question highlights the fact that because plastic is ubiquitous and there's so many types of it and so many uses of it, innovation has to not just be kind of a top down where I was saying, well, I'm sick of, you know, the single use plastic water bottle market, but then understanding the entire supply chain. And I, I do think circular economy is going to solve not all of those problems, but I think circular economy has to be really precise in what it's trying to solve. You're absolutely right. Like, my solution isn't going to replace those chairs that, or, or your, your report, recorder, but it might help with food packaging, right? So then starting to think in, as Mine said, more like horizontal and vertical ways to make connections. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to add to that, but I don't remember. So I may come back to you. I think Marissa right yeah, here. I came from the apparel industry before I came to beauty and the challenges, um, especially when it came to polyester and some of the fibers that um, are, you know, coming from, they are fossil fuel based. I think there was, you know, if you take the Ellen MacArthur Foundation approach to how do you make something more circular, it's more sustainable materials, it's designing for recyclability, it's keeping products at their highest use for the longest time, so think durability, right? When, and that, we, we were subscribers in my past life, we were subscribers to Ellen MacArthur and, and signed on to their Plastics Pact here too. That said, you know, with, with apparel, I think there was, you know, first designing for the recyclability, so can you, can you get to some type of blend that can be easily broken down, right? Um, that ha where the technology exists and can be done at scale where you can pull apart a multi-blended fiber. Can you then turn that fiber back into something that's meaningful, right? So we had, um, again, in my past life, a great relationship with a company that was getting excess plastics from China when they could no longer import uh, the excess plastics into China, they, they lost their supply chain, they lost their feedstock. So um, there's also things that are happening kind of around that. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think it's, it's one where I've seen a lot of progress in the last, I don't know, 10 years because the thought process of designing for something that can be broken down, the innovation to break it down, the use of materials once they have been broken down and reformulated, that is all happening now, which it wasn't before. So I have hope for the scuba suits and for other um, you know, plastic-based um, fibers, and, and there are probably a lot of people here who are in fashion and apparel who could tell you more. <laughs> right, and I, I think Mar Marissa hit at this question earlier. I mean, um, you raised the question of um, incentivizing sort of innovation in the supply chain. And so, <laughs> I mean, if anyone wanted to get into that in a little bit, but I'm gonna field maybe a couple questions. Is that okay, Allison? Two questions, and then we'll maybe try to combine them. Have there, and then there's one. Oh, I don't mean to make you run. Okay. Sorry. Wait, I mean, and quick question, and you know, this is coming up because where I come from, and I'm sure other places in the U.S. When I go back home, everybody's buying boxes and boxes of plastic water bottle because the water quality is not good. Yeah. So we have the issue of, you know, the plastic, but the reason behind why they feel that they have to, and of course, there's the filters, but that is also all plastic. So in a situation where the water quality in a place is not good, where they feel the need to buy water, how do we solve, like, I know, right? But then shouldn't we be investing them more also in the infrastructure and the water quality? Mm -hmm. Well, first I'll make a shout out to the Biden administration because they committed to eliminating lead pipes across America, which is huge, and I'm in Chicago. Yeah, it's a really big deal. It's a really big deal. Um, it's going to take a little longer than I would like, but um, in Chicago, we have uh, lead service lines. I mean, kids are drinking today, drinking water in Chicago with lead in it. Like, it's insane. We're the wealthiest country in the world, and kids are drinking water with lead. Um, so there, I, 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 I don't know exactly, um, like, there's a lot of ways to answer your question, but um, I think uh, the findings on nano plastics and microplastics is going to start, I think, 
uh, I predict a consumer backlash against those plastic water bottles. So I think those are going to be seen. I'm not saying that that doesn't solve the tap water problem, but I think people are going to start increasingly doubting the quality of the water that they're buying in a, a plastic bottle. Um, and my fear actually is that people are going to go to aluminum um, and aluminum is lined in polymer. So anytime you're drinking from an aluminum can, you're also drinking plastic. So it's not better. And actually from a carbon footprint, it's worse than plastic. So um, I think people are going to, there's going to be a backlash against that. And this is where I think solutions, maybe like Kadea or in other industries, whether it's your scuba gear or your chair, I think the supply chain transparency question is what I was trying to think of before. Supply chain transparency is really, really critical with, with you know, with all the digital tools that we have today, you should be able to scan that chair and find out what that material was and figure out where you should dispose of it. The problem is that we're innovating too quickly on, chem on chemicals, right? And we can't keep up with the policy. But um, in terms of what Kadea is doing, just to round out my answer, um, you can scan the QR code on the bottom and we tell you where your water came from. Mm -hmm. So we tell you what reservoir, what lines, what main lines, how your city treated it, what service line, how Kadea filtered it. And then why we did all those things to educate people. So I think there's a real spurt in education that's gonna come with water quality. Um, but absolutely, we have uneven water quality in this country, unfortunately. And I think that's fundamentally the, why the water bottle industry took off in the beginning. And we need to address that. I will say there's a plenary that I'm also moderating tomorrow with Catherine Flowers, who works a lot with water infrastructure and water quality, um, along with Dr. Jalone with the CEQ. So that's going to be something. It's going to be a quick panel uh, plenary session, but I feel like a lot of your answers are going to be there. Um, we have one question right here, and then I'll go to uh, this side because I feel like I'm ignoring you. I'm sorry. And then um, we have one last. We, ha we have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to try to make this brief. All right, and I work in the recycling industry, so we recycle about 200 million pounds of flexible plastics, your LDPEs. The biggest issue we have is collection, systems of collection, because if people don't know how they can recycle, that it ends up in a landfill or in a water body. Um, what are your thoughts in reference to ways to collect plastic? Because our customers buy plastic from us so they can make other plastic products, but we can't make enough of it. I was yeah. going to go, if you have an answer, but I was also going to go to Jonathan, but Marissa or, and, or John. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the key things is that uh, first we have to recognize that, right? And, and one, one, of the, one of the good answers is by putting a value on plastic. And so that works really well, and it can be done in different ways. Um, we have a huge um, issue and a huge industry around the world, which you, you may not be familiar with, but it's waste pickers. So... Not not common in the U.S., but they do exist, and uh, we we talked to them uh, recently. Uh, the head of that organization is from Portland, Oregon. She's called Barbara, and they or, they organize around the world. Uh, there are, there are uh, possibly 20 million waste pickers, mm -hmm. and so within the treaty, we have to think very carefully about what happens with them. They make a living off collecting um, the valuable plastic, so you know it's only certain items, mm -hmm. and so. We, we want to um, make sure that there's a transition for those workers in the treaty that's written into the treaty so they get treated better. Um, the, the, the higher the value we can put on more plastic and more types of plastic, they do better and, and you'll do better because you'll have um, you know, uh, steadier streams and, and larger streams of plastics that will go into the... Uh, and you'll, you'll, you will help drive our circular economy. So. I yes, know, because yeah. we pay for the yeah. plastic. So at the end of the day, it, it creates a new job, and we're building factories all over the country. Yeah. But it's the fact of just being able to collect it and being able to recycle it. We're thinking about it. I think, L'Oreal, you're going to want the material, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, part of my, I wanted to ask, is it because people don't know that this is recyclable and they're not, or you're, because I think we have multiple problems. You know, one is, consumers understanding what they can actually right. recycle. Is that the question? It's, it's difficult for con consumers to recycle because there's so many different types of plastic. Right. So plastic bottles is exactly. simple. It's a rigid product. You know, you can throw it in a, in a bin with a little circle and it's over with. 
our industry, we recycle flexible plastics, your LLDPE yep. uh, or your LDPEs. And so a lot of times it's more difficult to recycle and a lot of times people don't know what bin to put it in. And it, so it becomes an issue. So most of our business <laughs> comes from large manufacturers when they have a bell that's wrapped with shrink wrap or your mattress maker that has a large sheath. So we get you know millions of, of tons of that stuff that comes to us instead of going to landfills. And so our clients are like you know Dow Chemical and um, a lot of other large uh, plastics manufacturers that will use like maybe 25% of this product is made with our feedstock. You know, the, the, some of them want 100%, even like in the six pack ring industry, we have, you know, tons of, of six pack rings coming that we recycle. Okay, I really want to talk to you after this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that, that, I feel like that is, okay, we have five minutes. Can I take one more question, Allison, and then we're going to wrap up. I might run over here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, just so we can kind of get a wide, a wide swath of this. You. Thank you so much. Um, my name's Maddie Kaufman, and I work with the Miami-based nonprofit Debris Free Oceans. Uh, woo. Thank you. Uh, I'm from Baltimore, though, so I love Mr. Trash Wheel <laughs> and seeing it out in Panama. Um, but I've been in Miami for a decade and have seen the, the trash crisis get worse and worse. Our landfills have been filling up, and a year ago, our incinerator burnt down, where we used to send half of our county's waste. And uh, after that, our waste commissioner resigned, and uh, they're considering a moratorium on development until we have a plan to see how we handle all the waste that people moving in are going to generate. And uh, we're you know, trying to figure out if we should build a new incinerator, where we should put it. Our recycling, we only at curbside recycle plastic bottles, and the rate of recycling of those bottles in 2020 was 2%. And so you probably need a lot more information, but I was just wondering, um, like we're very centered around reuse systems. We ran a very small scale pilot in a neighborhood here. Obviously we can't roll that out at scale in the time needed, but I would love your input on, you know, what you would prioritize doing in a, a situation like this, what we should really prioritize our next steps being to handle this. That is just <laughs> maybe as you all think about that question, since we are running out of time, um, I want to maybe use this as a time to wrap up as a call to action, maybe. So what is our next step forward? And also, um, you know, just call to action um, in this panel. What do you want our audience to take away? Um, maybe we'll start at the end this time. Um, Mireille, I'm not sure if you're ready, um, but <laughs> putting in. I don't, I don't know if to answer the question or <laughs> do my wrap up. Um, you can also find me later. <laughs> yes, I will do that. Um, so wrap up, I think on, on collaboration, it's working together towards a common goal, but we need to keep in mind that how do we get to that common goal is gonna differ from every person's perspective. Um, collaboration also, especially across sectors, it is tedious and it is a lot of work. I don't know why it's so hard. <laughs> It's the road less traveled. So my call to action would be, please take the, the road less traveled and keep your eyes focused on the common goal. Okay, mine is, this, is positivity, positivity, positivity. The treaty is a, as a, is a fantastic thing. Um, it's gonna be uh, just a global uh, um, beacon for everybody to follow. We, you asked so many good questions and we didn't have the answers. That's okay. Uh, the treaty isn't gonna solve everything also, but it's gonna put a platform in place whereby everybody's aware of these issues. We're building in, for example, the gentleman talked about microplastics and plastics in, in your body and what's happening with that. That's getting put into the treaty. You know, it's gonna be, a, have a section in there. Um, we're talking about all sorts of other issues that are gonna be, as long as they're in the treaty and captured, we know that we can then address them and the world will get to do that during the COPs, the Conference of Party process that will come in the following years. And we're setting up this public-private partnership called EPIC. Um, you know, having Aspen involved in that is fantastic. And that's how we're also gonna innovate around the problems that we know that government just can't do it on our own. So we've set up these spaces where where you all and NGOs and communities can get involved and we'll bring you all in to share best practice and innovation. Um, I'm really, really excited about the future. Thanks. 
On that note, two simple thoughts. One, keep asking the questions. Keep asking the dumb questions, the dumb questions. And the second one is vote. It's an election year. So we were asked to think about who may be missing from this conversation. And um, the first thing we came up with was really the consumer. So my request to all of you is you have a lot of agency and a lot of power in being consumers. So send a strong signal for the demand for things like refillable formats and different ways of consuming. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, another round of applause for our panelists.